you for such an amazing week and so, um, so many opportunities to be grateful. Please watch over us this week as we grow to be more like you each and every day. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. Hey, if you're in the building, go ahead and have a seat. If you're watching online as part of our online community, uh, welcome. I just want to uh, do this. The last um, 52 hours and 33 minutes have rocked my world. Autumn and I left our house at 5 o'clock on Friday morning, got home last night at 8 p.m. Uh, I don't know how to describe it. I stand in front of you today. My, my, my stomach is in knots. My uh, mind is racing. Uh, my heart is beating faster than it's beat in a long time. My, my spirit is wrestling with God and my soul is str- I, I don't know how to to invite you in, other than to say the last 52 hours and 34 minutes have captured my soul. I I don't know where this teaching's going this morning. I have talked with Danielle, who's on the screen, and warned her in advance, and so there may be a slide that you just see forever on there, because I I just don't know where, I I know what I want to get through, but I, but I I just don't know. And so what I want to do, Daniel, at this time, uh, because I think it's important for you to see a couple things, if you could go to the end of the before we go slide, what I was going to do at the end, that's not how I want to end today, but there's some things I want to call to your attention uh, before we uh, get into this, just kind of before we go. I hope that uh, this week you received via email our impact report. I hope you've spent some time with it, thanking God for the things he's done in the life of Miami Valley Church over the first six months of the year for the uh, souls, the, the numbers, and then if you, if you read through it, you saw the little blurb that I wrote, it said just rejoice that every number represents a name, every name represents a story, and every story matters, every, every eternity that hangs in the balance, so thank you for your participation. If you did not get that and you want to see, we want to get it to you, please give us your most accurate email address on this card, uh, give it to us online, we want you to get this, get the hands to rejoice and to pray for the, even the greater things that God's going to do uh, in our midst, uh, one of the outreaches we have after school starts is going to come up. I think it's the bike uh, rodeo. Uh, if you just kind of be prepared for this, in our parking lot on August the 17th from 12 to 3, uh, kids can bring their bicycles in. They can have them ch- safety checked. They can uh, get free pizza and lemonade, look at bike helmets, maybe some new bike helmets, some things given away. If you want to be part of that, again, you can put it on the card. And Carol from our GO team, she'll get in touch with you. We'd love to have you uh, go local and, and serve in that capacity. If you came today uh, ready to give to the mission financially, you can do that. There's a card that's there in front of you uh, that says five different ways you can give. One of those ways is an offering envelope. You can put it You can put it in the Red Bulls. You can log online if you get bored with what I'm doing. You can log online and give uh, electronically uh, as we speak. And so I'm just excited. So here's what I need you to do. I, I don't know if I've told you, but the last 52 hours and 30 some odd minutes have just rocked my world. And, and I don't know how to convey to you what's in my heart today. So here's what I need you to do, whether you're watching somewhere around the world. By the way, uh, wasn't last week amazing as we got those baptisms? Did you know that, that, that there were people from Malaysia watching last week as their granddaughter was baptized? And I'm so thrilled that there's so many people from literally around the world watching what God is doing in this little corner of Fifth and Park. So thanks. And so wherever you're at, I just want to pray for you. But as I pray for you, I'm, I'm begging you. Pray for me. If you don't know how to pray, here's the prayer I want you to pray for me. Wherever you're at on your spiritual journey, would you just simply pray this prayer? Lord, help Tim. So while I'm praying for you, would you just say those uh, three simple words for me? Uh, Let's pray together. Father, I just thank you that uh, in this moment, as you've just uh, got me in a place where I haven't been for uh, a long time, that you would uh, calm the wrestling in my spirit, that you'd uh, relieve these knots that are in my stomach, that you'd uh, slow down my heart rate, God, that today, that today, that the only person anybody would see would be Jesus, glorified and lifted high. God, I hide myself behind his cross. And Father, I pray for each one that's walked into this room, that's watching behind some kind of screen. God, uh, you are at work in their souls. You're stirring, you're moving. You're preparing them for, for, for a moment. And God, I just ask that you would Um, speak to each of us, give us minds to hear, hands and feet to obey, and God, may uh, I leave this place differently than I stepped in this morning, and may that be true of all of us. 
In Jesus' precious name I pray, amen. So Autumn and I had been invited uh, to go to Morgantown, West Virginia on Friday night, uh, this past Friday night, to attend uh, a fundraising event for a for an incredible ministry that we'd been made aware of through some folks in the life of our church. And so we uh, went out to Morgantown to this event. Uh, and on the way, we thought, hey, our anniversary uh, is next week. Uh, by the way, 33 years, this beautiful lady's put up with me. And so um, she, deserves, she deserves some kind of an award for that. There's a, well, she's got all kinds of stories she could tell you about that. But um, so we thought, hey, uh, we'll go out early um, because uh, our two oldest daughters were born in Morgantown. We lived about 30 minutes from there on the Pennsylvania side of the border, and uh, we decided we'd go back out and we'd, we'd look at the, the, the house where we lived and the first few years of our, old two daughter, our oldest two daughters' lives. And, and uh, we pulled in, and um, weeds had grown over, and you couldn't even get close, couldn't even get close enough, but you could, could see that um, bright red piece of paper that had been posted on the door. And so you just figure that house has been condemned. And that just kind of stirs in your spirit. And you, and you, and you drive down the road and you, you see um, the church building that we were there, that we helped a uh, church uh, build because the building we were in while we were there was struck by two bolts of lightning and literally burned to the ground. And so we went through this process and, and even some of the grass there was just kind of overgrown and just kind of starts to stir in your spirit, you know, why, what's going on? And we, we drove through and we, 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 we thought about our story and we thought about our time there and, and wondered what God was doing. We spent seven years there that were fresh out of seminary and God called us there and, and the ministry that we had there and until Miami Valley called us to come here 23 some odd years ago and we, we, we drove around and then we, we went to this place um, called uh, Ohio Pile. It's a state park, just beautiful and we, we walked around and we got to the spot uh, where I had literally at one point been catapulted out of a whitewater raft as we were whitewater rafting. And I'm just, I remember that moment. I'm like, I never want to touch foot in this river ever again. And so we, 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 we had that moment. And I, I remember uh, looking at the spot there where I've told you that it's where uh, I went and, and yelled at God about this pain that I live with that I didn't understand. Uh, how could I be diagnosed with this kind of pain and this life lawless, this pain that's never going to go away? And God and I just had this moment uh, there. And so all this stuff's just uh, wrestling inside of my soul. And then, then we leave Ohio Pile and we go to this little town called uh, Confluence, Pennsylvania on the Yakagani River. And, and we have had more anniversary dinners at this little place called the River's Edge Cafe than any other one place that we've celebrated. So we, we celebrated our anniversary early on the porch of the, uh, the River, River's Edge Cafe and just had this beautiful moment and we just, you know, just all these things and we, we drive off to this, uh, to Morgantown, we get changed and it is hot in Morgantown on Friday night and the event was at a, at a boys ranch where they have a school and they, and they have 14 boys that live on the property, that go to school, they're boys that have been through the foster system, some have been adopted now and are just wrestling with life. And this ministry that started 14 years ago, and we got to hear the founder speak and share his vision. It just kind of stirs in your soul, but it's hot. And the event uh, was, um, we're coming to the ranch, so it's going to be like Western wear. And so we thought, that'd be fun. And so got my jeans, my cowboy boots, my Western shirt on, and I'm sweating like you wouldn't believe because, uh, uh, yeah, we lived in Texas for a while, so we got cowboy boots, and we got the Western stuff. <laughs> Don't break it out very often, but we got, we got the gear, and so we thought, that'd be fun, and so we, we do that, and, and so we're just wrestling, and we get to tour the school, and we get to tour the property, and God just starts, you know, stirring all these things up inside of you about uh, that, those stories. We got to hear the founder share his story. Uh, we got to hear a, a gentleman named Daniel, who, who, who was a guest speaker that night, who, who stood in front of us uh, barefoot and with no arms born that way. And he said, I'm looking at all of you. God gave you the deluxe edition. You got all got arms. I don't have any of those that God gave me. And he, he shares that from the moment of his birth, God was at work. And he, 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 he sat there and he, he autographed books with his toes. He put a pen inside of his toes and he, and he autographed books. And, 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 you, and you wrestle with this story and then you hear a 13-year-old boy that, that lives at the ranch 
stand up and begin to tell his story. That two days before his eighth birthday, he was removed from the home of his biological parents because of their addiction. He had a brother and two sisters, and they were immediately separated. The first home that his sisters went to, they got adopted. The second home his brother went to, he got adopted. This young boy, the first home, they, they found out after just a few short months that they didn't want him. The second home, they didn't want him. The third home, they didn't want him. Finally, there was a fourth home that took him in and adopted him, but he has so much anger inside of him. This is his words. He's got so much anger inside of him that he has no respect, especially for his, his, his adopted mother. And they're just in constant conflict. And so his adopted parents, he said, who I know love me dearly, thought that the only option for me was to put me here in this ranch where I've come to meet Jesus and where I've, where I've started to understand I need to not only respect my mother, I need to respect myself and I need to respect everybody else that I come in contact with. And you're just amazed at this story. And I just heard story after story after story. And thought about our story and, and, and where God has called us and what he's called us to. And, and these stories just, and they're just turning in my soul today. And, and, I, and, I, and I wonder, are, are you taking your place in God's story for you? Or, or are you trying to write your own story? Where do you find yourself fitting in the, in the story? And there's, and there's one piece that I'm going to ask you to take away today, and, and I don't know how I'm going to get there. I'm not ready to give it to you yet, and I'm going to get there some way, and I'm not sure yet how I'm going to get there. So you're praying, Lord, help Tim, right? Because so, so you're, you're praying that. And so, I'm just, but, but here's what I know. Stories matter. Stories hold power. And your story matters to God. And how you live out your story how you live out your call on his life. And so we're doing this. And, and so we went to this event and then we were fortunate enough that on a Saturday, the, the, the founder of this uh, boys uh, ranch um, invited us to come have a meeting with him and then to have lunch with him. And, and just to listen to his story and his vision is just powerful. Uh, by the way, uh, I, I read this, this is his book. It's called Seed Division. His name is Steve Finn, F-I-N-N, Seed Division. It is well worth a read if you want to get it on Amazon, uh, Seed Division. It tells the story of, of his, he uh, left after 17 years in law enforcement to follow this vision that God had placed in his heart to reach the boys of West Virginia who were in trouble. And so it was just this powerful story. And so, but the, the time we got to, got to have with him, and then he asked me a question. We talked and we spent several hours with him, and then he looked at me, and I, I, I'm, you know me well enough, I'm, I'm not in the forefront of those kind of meetings. I just kind of sit back and observe and hadn't said a word through, through any of the time. And he's like, tell me about your church. And I blew it. Because <laughs> there's all this stuff going on inside of me, but I've been wrestling with that. If somebody, I know what I want to say when somebody says, tell me about your church. And I couldn't come out with the right words. And so by the end of the day, I want to tell you about my heart's desire for, for you if you're part of Miami Valley Church today and, and moving into the future. But, but here's what I know in the context of story, that stories matter. Uh, we loved, I love to read stories. I love to listen to stories. Uh, I love to tell stories, uh, but stories matter. And I know that stories matter uh, to you too. And, and here's how I know, because on July 4th, Netflix released the latest season of, see, yeah, you knew. And by July 7th, Netflix reports that 30 million people had binge watched all the episodes of Stranger Things the last season. But it's not just 30 million people, it's some of you too. And here's how I know, because I saw it on Facebook. Check this out. Um, I, I blocked out names uh, and, and pictures so as to not uh, throw anybody under the bus. But the top one, uh, you can notice it says July 7th at 6.16 p.m. So this is released on July 4th. This is a member of our church. And they write, please let me know when you are done with Stranger Things so we can discuss. Now, now you'll notice, if you, if you can see it as you look down, it says one week, one week. I, cause that's because when I screenshotted the, this. Uh, this was just like July 7th, all these things start to happen. Uh, the first person just says, done. Um, the second person says, the second person says, text me now. I've been dry, dying to cry to someone. Um, uh, uh, the fourth person says, I was not emotionally ready for all of that. Emoji, crying face. Uh, Erica is now my new favorite. I don't know if that's a spoiler alert. I haven't seen it or not, so sorry about that if it is. But I love the third one, who is also a member of our church, uh, says, 
you've watched the entire third season already? Question mark, question mark, question mark. I, I don't get it. I don't get it. You've already done that. Uh, and, and so uh, uh, stories just matter. We love to get involved with stories. We love to, to get engaged with stories. And we are, in, we are in the story of Jesus in the gospel of Mark. If you have a Bible, Mark chapter 6, we're going to start in verse 6. Uh, and I want you to wrestle in your soul, but the soul, the story today is, is, is where's your story in alignment with his story? And, and I love Mark's gospel because I think Mark's gospel is kind of the way we binge watch the gospel because <laughs> he's in a hurry and you get through the 16 chapters and it's, it's this, 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 and this, and, and you're just on the move, on the move, on the move. And, and Mark's gospel uh, doesn't begin with the, with the nativity scene. It doesn't begin with the manger. It begins, this is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and, he, and he begins to tell the story of Jesus' walk and Jesus, uh, John the baptizer and the call of Jesus on the disciples and Jesus is going from village to village teaching and he's teaching a 17 word sermon. The time has come, the kingdom of God has drawn near. Repent and believe the good news and he's inviting them. He's almost sucking them into his story. The time has come, the kingdom of God is drawn near. Uh, enter into my story, repent and believe the good news. See where your story lines up with my story and he invites us into the story and we've been watching Jesus teach and we've been watching him preach and we've been watching him heal and Pastor Wooldridge last week took you through the first six verses of, of Mark chapter six and, and, he, and he said, if they only knew, remember if they only knew, you know, do, do you know, do you know the story and how Jesus captured them and Jesus was in his own hometown and, and the people, uh, he couldn't do anything there because of the people's unbelief. And he's bringing us into the story and we pick up the story. Mark uh, chapter six, uh, verse six, and it says this, that Jesus was going around the villages teaching. Here's what you need to know. This is Jesus's third circuit around the region of Galilee. I believe at this moment, we're two years into Jesus's public ministry. Here's why I know, because uh, in just a few verses, we're gonna see that the disciples feed 5,000 people based on a miracle that Jesus does. And Mark gives you this little detail. He says, the grass is green. Well, if the grass is green in Israel, we know it's the springtime. We know it's close to Passover. And we know by reading Mark's gospel that the next Passover, one year out, Jesus is going to be slaughtered. Jesus has a three-year public ministry, so we're at two years in. We're at two years in. And Jesus begins to go, uh, just, just so you know, can we see those maps? I'm, see, I'm bouncing around on Daniel. Just so you get region of Galilee. This is where Jesus' earthly ministry is headquartered, right there around the, around the Sea of Galilee. Next slide. Um, you, you kind of see he goes from village to village all around the Sea of Galilee, his home village of Nazareth, and he just goes village. This is his third circuit. He's made a, two circuits already through the region of Galilee. He's on his, starting his third circuit, Mark chapter 6, verse 6, but he does an interesting thing in Mark chapter 6, verse 7. In Mark chapter 6, verse 7, he sends the disciples out on their first circuit. Remember, Jesus, when he called the disciples, he said he went on a mountain and he prayed all night and he summoned to those, those he wanted to be with him so that he could send them out. So they've been with him for two years and he's about ready to send them out. He is in the process of creating, I don't know how else to say this, missionary disciples. If you think about discipleship without thinking about missionary tasks, you're thinking about discipleship incorrectly. Jesus needs to create in this three-year public ministry missionary disciples. And there's a problem. And the problem is that at two years in, these guys aren't ready. The problem at two years in is Jesus is dealing with missionary immaturity. Before we get to, the, before we get to Jesus sending them out, I, I need you to see the progression. Here's the progression. They're with Jesus about a year, and they're in a boat going across the Sea of Galilee, and a storm comes up, and Jesus is asleep in the middle of the boat. And the disciples get afraid, and they wake Jesus up, and they say, Teacher, don't you care? And Jesus looked at them. Remember, a year in, he looked at them, and he says, why are you so afraid? Do you still have, check this out, do you still have no faith? Zero faith, not a little faith. A year in, time with me, you've seen me teach, you've seen me do miracles, you've seen me heal, and you have zero faith, no faith, a year in. You'd think that would be bad enough, but we saw with Pastor Wooldridge last week, as Jesus goes back to his hometown and preaches, and I think this is about the crowd, but I think it's about the disciples too. It says this, that Jesus was amazed at their unbelief. I wish it was translated differently because it's the same word for faith. Do you still have no faith? I wish it was translated like this. Uh, he, Jesus, was amazed, uh, Jesus was amazed at their unfaith. I think unfaith is lower than zero faith. <laughs> I, I, I grew up, I, I had to ask Autumn, I didn't even know if this, it was, I didn't even know if 7-Up was still, still available on the market. When I was growing up, some of you will remember, 
Uh, do you remember how 7-Up Seven, Seven uh, branded themselves? They were the Uncola. They're like cola, but they're not cola. They were because it's, it's a different color and it tastes all different. It, uh, Jesus said, you, you, you have unfaith. It's not zero faith. It's less than zero faith. It's unfaith. And, and he, was, he was amazed at their unfaith. Check this out. Jesus was amazed when he looked and expected to see faith and saw none. Did you realize that this phrase about Jesus being amazed is used only two places in the scriptures? Here, where he is amazed that he doesn't see faith where he expects to see faith, and in Matthew chapter 8, verse 10, where he sees faith where he doesn't expect to find faith. Matthew 8, 10. Hearing this, a man came and said, Jesus, heal my child, and you don't even have to come to my house. Just speak the word because I'm a man under authority and you're under authority. All you have to do is say the word. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those truly following him, truly I tell you, I've not found anyone in all of Israel with so great a faith. Jesus is evaluating our faith And when he looks and expects to find it and sees none or sees un, he's amazed at our lack of faith in our story. When when he's like, this guy's not even a a, a Jewish man. I I don't expect him to have this kind of faith. And he's amazed. So I just want to ask you in your story right now, right today, where are you at? Jesus looks at your faith. Why do I ask? Because the scriptures say, without faith, it's impossible to please him. Does Jesus, is he amazed at your situation and says, by now I expected to find you walking in faith? Or is he looking at your situation, man, that just blows me away. (laughs) I didn't think they were this far along. Look at them. But but, but this isn't the end of this missionary immaturity. He he sees no faith. He sees unfaith. Um, Jesus is going to use the disciples to feed 5,000 people. Then they're going to be back in a boat across the sea and a storm's going to come up again. And there's uh, Jesus not in the boat. And Jesus is up praying and Jesus sees them. And we'll see this in a minute that Mark gives this little interesting tidbit that they're struggling on the sea in the middle of the storm. And Jesus comes walking by on water. And Mark's comment is Jesus intended to pass them by. None of the other gospel writers tell us that. Jesus intended to pass it. Why did he intend to pass them by? I think it's because by this time they should have had enough faith that they didn't need him in the boat with them. Uh, we've seen him do miracle when we were in a boat another time. But they cry out. So, so, so Mark then goes on to tell us this about the, the next slide, I think, Danielle. Uh, Mark gives us this little editorial comment. They had not understood about the loaves. Instead, their hearts were hardened. Did you see the progression? No faith leads to unfaith. Unfaith leads to a hard heart that becomes petrified and inaccessible. You're not even hearing the things of God anymore. You ought to be hearing the things of God, but you're not even hearing the things of God because you haven't been operating by faith, the faith that God expects to see in our lives. And it's just, it's, it's, it's no faith, it's unfaith, it's, it's, it's hard-hearted faith. And that ought to be enough, but that's, that's not the, where the process of missionary immaturity ends. Uh, the disciples hear Jesus teach, and Jesus tells stories, right? And, and the outsiders, they don't understand this story, and the disciples come to Jesus and say, hey, would you, would you tell us what this means? And they've done this before, but, but when they come to Jesus this time, look, look what he says to them. Next slide. Are you so dull? He asks. Don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile what Jesus we don't understand? It, no faith leads to unfaith. Unfaith leads to hard-hearted faith. Hard-hearted faith leads to dull faith. And dull faith, this word, means the inability to put into practice what you know to be true. Guys, you should have heard it. Your hearts are so hard you don't understand it. Here's how I think it plays out in the, in the modern Christian's life. We, we don't think about discipleship in terms of missionary discipleship. We don't think about it in terms of being fearless. We don't think about it, are we li- really living out our story to the glory and, and the obedience of Christ? And so we don't operate in faith. And, and we have no faith. And then the longer we have no faith, it becomes unfaith. And then our unfaith becomes a hard heart where we don't even perceive the things of God. And it becomes, we're, we're dull. We don't put into practice the things of God. And here's how I see it playing out in most Christians' lives Here's the question I get, and when somebody asks me or tells me this statement or, or, under, or, or says this to me, I'm like, mm, this is a faith problem. When people come to me and say to me, hey, Pastor Tim, I read the Bible and don't get anything out of it. 
as if you're blaming God for that. That's not on God. That's on you. And it's a lack of faith. And I just want to know, in, in your story, when Jesus looks, does he, is he amazed because of your lack of faith or is he amazed at your faith? No faith, unfaith, hard-hearted faith, dull faith. Jesus is dealing with missionary immaturity. And as I'm wrestling with these stories, and my knot is in my stomach, my uh, spirit is wrestling with God, and my, my, my heart is racing, and my mind is, is, is just going back and forth, and, and my, my, my spirit is in at peace. God begins to speak, hey, Tim, where you find yourself in this, in this pattern of faith? Are you, are you being a, a, an, an immature missionary disciple? Am, am I dealing with missionary immaturity in your life? Hey, Tim, I, I, I want to deal with some of this in your life. And I think he wants to deal with it not just in my life, but in the, in the life of us collectively as Miami Valley Church. Because you see, it can not only happen to individuals, it can, it can happen to, to churches, and I think it's happened to us. And that's on me. Every, every problem, every, every situation I see in this church, my friend, uh, the, the, the reason behind it is based at the man that I stare at in the mirror every morning. It's on me. I, I, I'm, I'm taking the blame for this, friends, but, but I'm telling you, no more. I've done business with God. I've confessed, and I just need you to know uh, we have a story to live out. God's not done with us yet. And the only way we're going to move forward is by faith. And so I've, I've got to wonder, it can happen to individuals, it can happen to churches. And I think, I think as, as, churches, God would look, as a church, God would look at us and say, hey, uh, there just hadn't been any faith for a long time. And your no faith has moved to unfaith. And your unfaith moves to hard-hearted faith. And, and, and I just wonder if we're not even teetering on the edge of being a, a, a church that's dull. And again, friends, this is on me. This is on nobody else. And that's why my heart and my spirit is, is racing this morning. But I, I ask you to, to deal with it yourself in your own life and, 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 then, and, and your role in the church. Because God wants to deal, Jesus wants to deal with this missionary immaturity. And I, and, and I, I, want, I want to move quick because I've got so much to say. Um, but as, as Jesus begins to deal with this missionary immaturity, we're at a stage in Jesus' ministry two years in that for the next year, between now and the last week of Jesus' life when he intentionally heads towards Jerusalem to be crucified. In Mark's gospel, so Jesus does, does an amazing thing four times. He goes on four separate withdrawals with the disciples. He takes them out of a ministry situation and he, and, and he backs them off to, to a territory, to a, to a lonely place where, where he begins to teach them. He does it four separate occasions. We're gonna look at this today, at the first one and next week at the next three. But as Jesus begins to take them into this to this to this place, what he does is he, he works at, at three things. He, he tries, I think, his best. He's got a year to get these guys ready. And there's a plan, and his plan is to die on a cross, rise from the dead, appear for about 50 days to a whole bunch of people, and then ascend into heaven and to leave with his disciples, to leave with 11 guys the task of taking the message of Jesus to the whole world. And there's no plan B. And Jesus has a year to get them ready to deal with their missionary immaturity. And he does three things. And the three things, and we'll see this consistently over the next couple of weeks. The first thing he does is that he begins uh, to give them, to, to provide a, a missionary impetus. A, a missionary impetus. Uh, an impetus is the encouragement resulting in increased activity. <laughs> And so Mark chapter 6, um, verses 7 and following, he, he, he sends them out two by two. And, and, you, and you look at the first verse. Let me, let me, let me find this. Um, he summoned in verse 7, he summoned the 12 and began to send them out in pairs and gave them authority over unclean spirits. When Jesus deals with uh, missionary impetus to, to get us away from our immature, the first thing is he's got to give us this motivating factor. And his motivating factor here is twofold. The motivating factor is his authority. He gave them authority. But check this out. The Greek word for authority it meant he kept on giving them authority. So he sends them out two by two to do their circuit of the Galilee region. And somehow, some way, even when he's not physically present with them, Mark says he kept on giving them authority. Authority, uh, authority. It, it means um, he made them the, uh, his authorized representative over a region. Take that, his authorized representative over a region. 
authorized representatives matter. When my mom passed away, I went home to be with Jesus. Um, my dad distributed um, her earthly belongings uh, among uh, all of us. And uh, one of the things he, he gave to Autumn that he said my mom wanted her to have was, was this uh, really, really fancy wristwatch. Um, a very expensive wristwatch. Um, and it wasn't working. And so um, we took it to a jeweler and said, hey, can you fix this? And they said, absolutely, yes. And they had it for about um, three weeks and ne never got it. And finally, we got it back. It still wasn't working. And, and finally, um, there are only a couple of authorized representative, authorized dealers of this watch brand in the country. And we happened to be going to one of the places where they were. And, and we took it. And, and they began, to, yeah, we, obviously we can fix it, and we gave it to them. And, and they called us and said, this is going to be more expensive than we thought because uh, we found super glue inside the watch casing. Because the unauthorized representative didn't know how to deal with it. Jesus selects authorized representatives to go out. You, as a follower of Jesus, are an authorized representative. You have the ability in his authority to deal with the region where he's planted you, this valley, your neighborhood, your situation, your family, you and you alone are the authorized representative to where he has sent you. Nobody else can do what he's called you to do. And if you trust somebody else to do it, they're gonna put super glue inside of the things you're supposed to be doing. You and me, we're the authorized representatives. So, so, so he, he deals with our immaturity by saying, I need you to understand this. Here, I give you authority, and I'm going to keep on giving it to you. I'm going to keep on giving it to you. I'm going to keep on giving it to you. As long as you're living in the region where I want you to live, doing what I've called you to do, you, are my, you have my authority. You're my authorized representative. The second thing he gave them to deal with this impetus is, is he gave them, he, he them clear-cut instructions. He sent them out two by two, which tells us we shouldn't be doing any solo ministry. He said, hey, I want you to move lightly. I want you to move freely. I want you to move with urgency. And I want you to go around and preach. And we see this gospel that he preached with. They, they, they preached repentance, that people should repent, and they healed. And so they're operating just as Jesus wants them to do. And they're starting to get all this, all this missionary uh, maturity. They're, they're starting to take steps. But he stops the story and I think we need to stop here as you're trying to move towards maturity, uh, away from immaturity. Uh, from the beginning, uh, Jesus wants us to understand that when we move towards missionary discipleship, uh, there's going to be opposition. Can I say a word to you this morning just about missionary opposition? Because Mark gives us the word. He actually gives us three words about missionary opposition. And the, the first one uh, comes this way. He said, uh, whenever you enter a house, verse 10 uh, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that place. If any place does not welcome you or listen to you when you leave there, shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. The first word about missionary opposition is there will be, here's the word rejection. There will be rejection. And just wants us to know this up front. Hey, you're going to be rejected. But please understand, he said, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting you're there, my authorized representative, and what they're rejecting is the peace that you have to offer, the completeness, the wholeness that only Jesus can provide. So when you go, don't be surprised that you're going to be rejected. And when you're rejected, don't let that slow you down. Shake the dust off your feet and keep on moving. Because there's somebody out there that's ready to receive the message. And so often, friends, we chase after those people who have rejected us and our message, and we forget about the person that's ready to receive what Jesus has to bring to them. Sometimes you shake the dust off your feet and you keep moving when rejection comes. But then he gives a second word about missionary opposition because he inserts, remember we've talked about that Mark gives us what we call these Mark and sandwiches. He tells a story and he interrupts it and inserts another story about the same theme before he concludes the first story. So you think the guys went out to preach and teach and, and then the story ends, chapter 6, verse 30, which says they came back and reported to Jesus all they had said and all they had done. But in between... Mark inserts this story about John the Baptist and King Herod. And if you don't know this story, I, I need you to, to hear it because it's a weird one. The word here isn't reject, missionary opposition. The first word is rejection. The second word is persecution. 
and you respond to persecution differently than you respond to, to rejection. Just out of the blue, Mark shifts gears and inserts the second story. It said, King Herod heard about it. The disciples were going around preaching because Jesus' name had become well known. Let me just stop there. That, that's verse 14. The disciples had done one thing and done it well. They made Jesus famous. It wasn't about them. King Herod didn't hear about how great the disciples were, didn't how great the 12 were. They made Jesus famous. King Herod heard about it because Jesus' name had become well known. Some said, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead and that's why miraculous powers are at work in him. Others have said he's Elijah, still others said he's a prophet like one of the prophets from long ago. When Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I have beheaded, has been raised. And the first hearers of this story are going to be like, what did you just say? John, who had been what? Beheaded? I don't know that story. Because remember, these aren't Jewish people. These are Greeks from the outside. But, but they know the name John. They know the name Herod. said, uh, tell me more. So here comes the story. For Herod himself had given orders to arrest John and chain him in prison on account of Herodias. Can't make this stuff up his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. Why Philip was still alive. He married his brother's wife, the king. And John, verse 18, John had been telling Herod, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Why does he have to deal with missionary immaturity? Why does he have to give us missionary impetus? Because we're going to have to deal with persecution and sometimes we're going to have to stand up and tell truth to power. And sometimes you're going to have to tell truth to people who don't want to hear it. And sometimes you're going to have to take a stand. When there's rejection, shake the dust off your feet and keep on moving. When there's persecution, stand your ground and don't go anywhere. So Herodias, the wife, held a grudge against John because her life's better now that she's married to King Herod instead of her brother Philip. She's got a way better life. And so she holds a grudge against John and wants to kill him, but she could not because, check this out, Herod feared, feared John and protected him knowing he was a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard him, check this out, when Herod heard him, he would be very perplexed because he likes to listen to him. Even though John, check this out, even though John was saying, you shouldn't be living like that, Herod liked to hear it. Maybe it's because there's nobody else telling him the truth. He enjoyed listening to him. Nobody else was speaking the truth into his life. Uh, So Herodias held this grudge. She couldn't uh, because Herod feared him and John protected him. He liked to listen to him. But then an opportune time came on his birthday. By the way, any of all the people I know in my life, there's one person who loves her birthday more than anybody else, and that's Miss Amy, who had her birthday yesterday. Happy belated birthday, Miss Amy. So, and I know you would never act like this. So, um, uh, an opportune time came on his birth, Herod's birthday, and Herod gave a banquet for his nobles, military commanders, and the leading men of Galilee. He's got a, ba- a guy's party going on. And it's not a good kind of party. As you can imagine, there's drinking, there's dancing, there's women who, who aren't their wives. Check this out. So Herodias' own daughter came in and danced, and she pleased Herod and his guests. This teenage girl, best I can tell, it's, it's King Herod's niece. And I apologize for the crude language that I'm about to use, parents. So you, I beg of you to forgive me. She came in And she did a seductive kind of dance. And when it says the men were pleased, it literally means they were sexually aroused. How crude is that to be sexually aroused by your niece? So much so that the king said to the girl, ask me whatever you want and I'll give it to you. He promised her with an oath, whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half my kingdom. He was so drunk out of his mind in ecstasy, he said, ask me for half of my kingdom and it's yours. And the little girl, the teenage girl, didn't know what to do. So she ran out to her mommy, remember, who holds a grudge against John the Baptist because he's speaking the truth. And the mommy says, go back in and ask the king that you want the head of John the Baptist on a platter. 
But she goes back in and tells King Herod, here's what I want. I want the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And because he'd taken this oath publicly and because he couldn't humiliate himself in front of all these men that he'd gathered, he sends out an executioner. By the way, one of the reasons we know Mark's audience is Greek and not Jewish is the Latin words that he uses. Here's one of them, an executioner. He sends out an executioner who goes out, beheads John the Baptist, and brings the head of John the Baptizer back on a platter. Why does Jesus tell this story in the middle of all of this? Because he has a word to say to you. He understands no faith, unfaith, hard-hearted faith, dull faith. And one of the reasons we stopped acting in faith is because we know that God's going to challenge us to take a step of faith that might result in rejection and it might result in persecution. And some of the times we just step back and say, no, thank you. I don't want to deal with that. I'd rather have my life at ease. We American Christians struggle with this concept because uh, we don't endure persecution. 72% of the world's Christians endure this kind of persecution. They are at risk for losing their lives. 72% of the Christians across the world were in the 28% that doesn't. And we think if somebody slams the door in our face and rejects us, that's persecution and it's not. And I just want to know, what is God calling you to do? Do you hear it? Are you dull? Are you hard-hearted? Do you have unfaith? Do you have no faith? Or does he look at you and say, this person's ready to move in faith. Friends, I I just need you to know I'm ready to move in faith. It's time. And Jesus begins to deal with our immaturity and he begins to deal with this impetus. And he's going to do two other things. And and I need to wrap up today because that's as far as we're going to go. But there's there's one thing, the, the truth I want you to walk away with is this. Uh, it's a question first. That's not right. A statement first. If the call of Jesus on your life right now is not stretching you to your limits, scaring you half to death, and requiring a sacrifice of you, there's a chance that you do not understand his voice and the way that he works in our lives. If, let me say it again, if the call of Jesus on you right now is not stretching you to your limits, scaring you half to death, and requiring an incredible sacrifice, it's not faith. And it's likely that you don't understand how to hear his voice and where he's calling you to move. Here's the good news. He calls the disciples to him. He sends them out. The the most powerful verse, I I think it's like verse 13 of Mark chapter 6. It says, so they went out. (laughs) In the midst of rejection, in the midst of of persecution, so they went out. We can criticize them all they want, but their hearts, their ears are going to become a little less dull. Their hearts are become a little less hard. They're going to start operating in faith, and they're going to start uh, having the kind of faith that he wants them so they can go and change the world. But it's a process, and it's going to take Jesus a year to really plant these truths inside their heart. Here's the takeaway. Friends, there, there are some things, and maybe next week I'll get to a chance to, to share them with you, some things that God's been calling me to for a while that I started saying no to for so long that my heart became hard, and I stopped hearing him say, Tim, this is what I want you to do. I heard him again Friday night, and I can't get it out of my spirit can't get it out of my soul. It scares me half to death. It it will stretch me to my limits. And it's going to require faith. But I know that to be the voice of God in my life. Here's the truth I want you to, wherever you're out on your spiritual journey today, here's the spiritual truth. Uh, Daniel, if God calls you to it, he will grace you for it, equip you in it, and sustain you through it. And that's the story of the disciples. He called them to it. He called them to himself. He called them to go out and preach, to do his word, to to speak his word, to do his work. And what we begin to see is that as they're stepping out in faith, he begins to grace them in it, to, to, to show them this is who they are, to show them the power, to show them the authority that they walk in, to show them the clear cut directions. And he graces them for, we call them spiritual gifts. They're grace gifts. He, he calls us to it. He graces us in it. He equips us for it. 
Some of you are, God's stretching you to the limits and he's giving you the scary dream. It's scaring you half to death and you don't know if you're supposed to go for it and you don't want to take that first step and he just wants you to know if you take that first step, you're not equipped for it. You're not going to be able to carry it to completion. But as you take those steps of faith, I will equip you in it as you step in faith. And then the promise is rejection, persecution. We'll see the other word, the third word next week. Whatever it is you face, I will sustain you in it. And there's some of you that need to camp out right there right now because you're going through it right now. And where you're living, scaring you half to death, you've taken a step and you're not sure what tomorrow holds. You're maybe not even sure what this afternoon holds. But you're being, uh, you're acting in faith and I want you to know Jesus is going to grace you in it. He's going to equip you for it. And he is going to sustain you to do what he's called you to do. Your story matters. And you, and you alone, are his authorized representative in your region to do what he's called you to do. I can't do what God's called Steve Finn to do in West Virginia. I wouldn't have the success that he's having because that's not his call on my life. I can't do what God's called you to do. I can't go through, I can go through it with you, but I can't go through it for you. Friend, where are you at? Where do you find yourself in the journey? No faith, unfaith, hard-hearted faith, dull faith? Or right here? God, show me your call on my life. God, grace me for it. I, I know the call, but I need you to grace me so I can start it. I need you to quit me because I'm in the middle of it, and I need you to sustain me because I am in the depths of it. Father, I just come to you right now, and um, I just believe with all my heart this is as far as you wanted us to go today. I, I wanted to get further, but I, I just think you wanted us to, to just camp out here for a minute. God, some of us, truth be told, are, are really immature missionary disciples. You look at us and you're amazed. You look at us and some of us and like, man, I expected to find faith there. And I, I just don't see any of it. And some of us have lived there so long that our no faith became unfaith, that our unfaith became hard-hearted faith, and now we're just so dull we don't even hear anymore, don't even attempt to obey. God, I beg of you to forgive us. Forgive us individually. Forgive us as a church. God, you call us to walk. God, I want to be the kind of man, husband and dad, pastor, that, that models a faith that even when I'm stretched to my limits, scared half to death and unsure about where it's going to go. I just say yes, because I know that that's where you've called me, where you've graced me, where you've equipped me, and where you'll sustain me. Father, I pray that we'll be that kind of church again, starting to operate in faith. And Father, most of all this morning, I, I pray for the one who's never taken that first step of faith that said yes to Jesus that said, I choose Jesus. I take a step of faith that says, I believe he died on a cross. He rose from the dead. He became my substitute sufferer. I don't understand it all, but come into my life, Lord Jesus. I choose to follow you. Father, for some of us that have prayed that prayer and just taken your salvation as our fire insurance from hell and just our, our living lives that aren't of faith, God, we know we don't please you. So God, I pray that we would would allow you to deal with our immaturity, that we'd allow you to begin to put inside of us your, your impetus, your, a sense that we are your authorized representatives in our homes, in our neighborhoods, in our valley. And God, that we'll just do what the disciples go, that it will be said of us so they went in the face of rejection and opposition. So God, whatever we're dealing with, God, I just pray that you would take the, the truths of your word plant it deep into our hearts, and that each and every one of us take our next best step of faith. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hey, I'd love to know what your next best step of faith is. If today you've taken a step of faith, and that's to ask Jesus to be your Savior, would you put it down on your card? You can put the cards in the red bowls. You can fill it out on our church app. Here's what I know. Some of you come to this place, you watch online week after week after week, and there is no evidence that you're taking any steps of faith. There's no evidence. 
Maybe that's true of my life as well. I think it just needs to stop. I would love to know, what's your next best step of faith? It helps me as your pastor know how to pray for you. It helps our staff know how to serve you. Would you let us know? I'll be hanging around down front. I would love to talk with you about this next step. There are other pastors that are here. We'd love to talk with you. If we can pray for you, you're going through it and you just need a prayer to help sustain you in the middle of it, would you let us pray for you as well? Watch your next best step of faith and may I challenge you with all of my heart. Take it because that's what's going to please God. Almighty God, as we go from this place, may we go taking our next best step of faith. May you deal with our immaturity this week as you begin to show us your authority and your instructions. And may we faithfully obey. In the precious name of Jesus, I pray. Thanks for praying for me. I hope you saw evidence that your prayers helped. I felt like it helped me. Pray for me that we get through the, the next gathering as well. And if there's any decision you've made today, I'd love to talk with you. I'm down front to talk with you and pray with you. God bless you. Have a great week. Will I ever live under that beautiful shadow of the cross? I hear stories of freedom Why can't I just believe them And make my way To the cross At the cross You wait patiently Take every chain away from me At the cross Where one step can turn The darkest of night To the brightest morn I leave it all And then some more At the cross Such a long hard road not meant to make it on my own I thank God for those who carry the cross And push me oh so gently to the cross You wait patiently Take every chain away from me At the cross Where one step can turn The darkest of night To the brightest morn I leave it all And then some more At the cross Yeah, I leave it all Behind me at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now. I'm happy all the day, and now I'm happy all the day. I love